now have five seconds for silent mourning. In a valiant last ditch attempt to hold the nation together and before it is ir irreconcilably divided between the national anthems of the VFL and the, v the VFA, I have sought a formula for national reconciliation, for which I would ask you now all please to stand. Hungry? Have a four and twenty pie. Have a lovely pie, me boys, a four and twenty pie. Lovely tasty pastry in a four and twenty pie. Lots of lovely tender meat, the finest you can buy. How a lovely pie, me boys, a four and twenty pie. Lots of lovely tender meat and golden pastry. Four and twenty. Oi! How a lovely pie, me boys, a four and twenty pie. Oi! Now, as has become customary, I have received a number of telegrams on the occasion of this, the grand final Ron Barassi Memorial Lecture, at which, unfortunately, the great man himself said a quarter of an hour ago that he could not be present. Absolutely consistently with all my previous statements, I resolutely refuse to announce whether I will permit the game to proceed until the umpire's whistle blows next Saturday, signed Big Mal. <laughs> Up you, Kazali, signed Goff. <laughs> After last Saturday, have applied for political asylum in Boston, signed Pete Clark. Those who watched, as I did several years ago, a TV show called The Big Game, in which costumed footballers, costumed in uniform, that is, and not in drag, were asked to answer a series of quiz questions for the honour of the club and some slight material reward, such as a see-through Whitmont shirt and a slightly used Holden by courtesy of Kevin Dennis's Autorama, <laughs> and observed the following exchange. What team does Graham Kennedy barrack for? St Kilda, correct, whereupon a scantily clad go-go girl danced onto the screen, waving a pair of flags and leaving it open to some doubt as to whether she was the prize for this segment of the show. <laughs> John Peck has four children. Are they all daughters or all sons? Daughters, correct. What famous scientist produced the theory of relativity? Don't know. Those who observe this might well wonder whether there is sufficient intellectual content in the great Australian game to justify its inclusion in serious academic discourse. However, there is already a fair body of academic studies. For example, Professor Dunn's pioneering work on the incidence of brain hernia among reserve 18s. <laughs> Professor Waller's definitive text, Graham Dempsey, The Brownlow Middle and the Rule of Law, Professor Bradley's penetrating analysis, Barassi and Hamlet, a comparative study in the tragic hero. <laughs> Professor Davis's distinguished monograph, informal voting for the Collingwood Committee. <laughs> Professor Andrew's pile driving paper on surgery of the back pocket. <laughs> and my own modest contribution, tie those kangaroos down, Tom. It is evident that academic exploration of this highly significant social phenomenon already provides a substantial proportion of the intellectual output of this university. And that is as it should be, because we are the inheritors of a long and distinguished tradition of intellectual inquiry. Beginning with one Joseph Strutt, the first historian of British sport, who in a work called The Sports and Pastimes of the People of England, published in 1801, said, in order to form a just estimation of the character of any particular people, it is absolutely necessary to investigate the sports and pastimes most generally prevalent among them. When we follow them into their retirements, where no disguise is necessary, we are most likely to see them in their true state and may best judge of their natural dispositions. And here Strutt is urging the claim of recreation of leisure activities 
as a key to the national character. It's a claim given respectability by some historians, not only those who might be thought to have a vested interest, as does Dr Percy Young, the distinguished author of a history of British football, who writes that when one is writing a history of football, one is in effect constructing a history of the nation, but also from general historians, especially as we might expect the Americans. Let me quote two examples. In 1944, Dr Dixon Wechter found that cricket was a game of leisured boredom and sudden crises met with cool mastery to the ripple of applause, characteristic of the British national character. Whereas football, with its rugged individualism, and baseball, with its equality of opportunity, were valid American symbols. <laughs> and in 1951, David Reisman and Rule Denny contrasted the democratic ideology prevailing in the United States with the class-ridden atmosphere of the United Kingdom. In the United Kingdom, they wrote, working-class audiences watched gentlemen in action and were looking particularly for good form and a respect for the law. For them, legality was more important than power. By contrast, American audiences were on a level with the players and power-oriented, while the American competitive spirit was reflected as much in the desire to win as in high-production goals in industry. At an even more profound level, football illuminates not only national character but life itself. Thus, the Chinese poet Li Yu, who wrote between AD 50 and AD 130, A round ball and a square goal suggest the shape of the yin and the yang. The ball is like the full moon, and the two teams stand opposed. Captains are appointed and take their place. In the game, make no allowance for relationship, and let there be no partiality. Determination and coolness are essential, and there must not be the slightest irritation for failure. Such is the game. Let its principles apply to life. Australian historians haven't gone so far, but other commentators have ventured into the field. Thus, Donald Horne, writing in 1967. It is only in sport and as soldiers that most Australians confidently see themselves as being of world class. Only in sport? The qualification would seem meaningless to many Australians. What else is there that matters as much as sport? It is only in sport that many Australians express those approaches to life that a non-Australian have expressed in any other connection. Here it is good to be unashamedly expert, ambitious and competitive, to proclaim faith, dedication and difference. It was almost as if the nation had been built on sport, had acquired its international significance from sport. Sport seemed to be what Australia was about. Playing games or watching them was to play one's role as an Australian. And the comment is not altogether unjust. The movement from sport to national character rests on a Rousseauian man was born free but everywhere is in chains kind of assumption. But social life forces men to play roles which do not represent their true selves. That only in relaxation, freed from the demands of society, are their true selves revealed. But it's difficult to assert that football, in particular, is the key to Australian character, if there is any such thing. Firstly, because it replaced cricket only about 30 years ago as the most popular spectator sport. And secondly, because all spectator sports are now giving way to particip participant sports like golf, yachting, surfing and skiing. And finally, because Australia is divided by a deep cultural rift between the north and south, known as the Barassi Line, which runs between Canberra, Broken Hill, Birdsville and Manangrida and divides Australia between rugby and rules. I would prefer to, uh, prefer to argue more empirically. Melbourne has a population of round about 2.5 million people. The major competition is that of the VFL. In the 1975 season, 12 clubs played 22 rounds of home and home and five finals to a total of attendance of around about 3 million. In my estimate, that means in terms of man-hours per week, somewhere between two and six million. For those of you who are interested in the discipline of sociometrics, I should perhaps explain my method of calculation. I've taken myself at an average of eight hours per week, 
I multiplied by itself by one-fifth of the population, equaling one half a million people, and arrived at the figure of four million man-hours, and then I've allowed plus or minus two million man-hours in case I've got the coefficients wrong. <laughs> that could be made more precise by a survey, but unfortunately the VFL won't play ball. It is, however, supported by some invest independent investigations. For example, the late George Johnston captured the atmosphere thus. In Melbourne, football is a fever disease like recurrent malaria and evidently incurable. Aussie rules in the austere southern capital probably has a bigger and undeniably a more frenetic following than all the other codes in Australia put together. For six or seven months of the year, a mad contagion runs through press, television, radio and everyday life. An acidulous Sydney man, himself a rugby union addict, put it to me that Melbourne has no summer, only a period of hibernation between football seasons. <laughs> I had forgotten until I went back to a grand final on the MCG what it was really like. That unbelievable roar of over 100,000 screaming zealots, baying for blood and bruises, the toss and tumult of partisan colours, the streamers, the hats, the emblems, the banners, frenzy, hysteria. No other sporting event in Australia draws a crowd as big or committed as this. For a time, men become gods and heroes. And in Melbourne, the mythical conflict between winter and summer is institutionalised in the struggle between cricket and football clubs for the Saturdays of spring and autumn, and winter is winning. Indeed, Melbourne football has taken on something of the character of a pr primitive religion. Thus, on one occasion, the distinguished Methodist divine, the Reverend Alan Walker, addressed a mission to the nation at a VFL grand final on the Melbourne cricket ground. Ladies and gentlemen, gather on this great occasion, whichever team we may support, whether it be the saints or the demons, we can surely all agree that we are joined together in this, that we are brothers and sisters in Christ. Whereupon there came a mighty voice from the southern stand. What about the bloody umpire? <laughs> and indeed, football is already invading the territory of the sacred texts. Thus, Father Dowling, the historian of the North Melbourne Football Club, advised North Melbourne supporters that they should place his book on their bedside tables alongside the family Bible, and further, that they should consult it more often. <laughs> In historical terms, the problem which interests me is the transition from football as a popular pastime, a folk game, to football as a recreation for gentlemen, to football as the most popular spectator sport, a major sector of mass entertainment. The questions which arise are like these. What has caused this change in the character of the game? How has this change affected the game itself, its organisation, its rules, its style of play? How has it affected the players and spectators? What is the function of football in modern society? In 1969, I visited a small town called Ashbourne in Derbyshire in the United Kingdom. Isaac Walton had fished near Ashbourne. George Eliot had lived in Ashbourne when, while she was writing her last novels. Uh, I didn't know that at the time. I'd gone there to watch a football match. An interesting game, an all-in game. The town of Ashbourne was divided between the uppers and the downards, depending on which side of the river the people lived and they all played. The game began at 2 p.m. on Shrove Tuesday and ran through until 10 p.m. on that night with intervals for tea and other refreshments. It resumed at 2 p.m. on Ash Wednesday and ran through till 10 p.m. that night. The aim of the game was to score a goal by striking the ball against one or other of two middle wheels which were each at one and a half miles distance from the centre of the town. The method was to convey the ball to the mill wheels by any means bar motorisation which was regarded as being unsporting. <laughs> At one point in the evening the ball disappeared for an hour and a half. It later, it later emerged that a devoted supporter of the upper side had taken the ball to the local public dyke, placed it in the cistern and sat on it, re-emerging in time to score a goal at 9.55. At 10pm on Ash Wednesday, the game ended after the players had ploughed for through two days through snow and ice with a characteristic British football score. Drawn game won all. <laughs> Folklorist have often thought of games 
not as conscious inventions, but as survivals from primitive conditions under which they originated in magical rites. And so it was at Ashbourne, and so was the kind of game which first came to Australia. The early immigrants to this country brought with them the traditional English outdoor recreations of their time, and these they played on Christmas and New Year holidays. Thus, the first Melbourne sporting paper, Bell's Life, reported at Christmas 1857 about Bendigo miners that they engaged themselves in running, jumping, climbing greasy poles and grinning through horse collars after the manner of their ancestors. While at the Duke of York in Paran in Christmas 1858, the patrons were climbing the greasy pole, the pig with the greasy tail, football and all the usual Christmas sports. Unfortunately, no details of those games survive, and in any case, they're not particularly relevant except to confute those romantics who still persist in believing that Australian football grew out of the bucolic amusements of Irish-born miners on the gold fields of Bendigo and Ballarat. Because in between these two Christmases, one Thomas Wentworth Wills, a leading member of the Melbourne Cricket Club, wrote to Bell's Life deploring the absence of a suitable winter, re winter recreation and suggesting the formation of a football club. Wills was a man of impeccable Australian nationalist connections. His grandfather, Edward, had been transported for life for highway robbery, <laughs> after which he did well in sealing and shipping. His grandmother married for the second time George Howe, a convict and the first printer of the Sydney Gazette. His uncle Tom, for whom he was named, married a daughter of Thomas Rivey, a convict, a landowner and a director of the Bank of New South Wales. <laughs> One aunt married Dr Redfern, who had been transported for sympathising with the naval mutineers of the Spithead and the Noor, while another aunt married the aide de camp to Governor Lachlan Macquarie. And Tom was also named for William Charles Wentworth, the great Australian patriot whose father Darcy had narrowly escaped transportation for highway robbery, having been allowed instead to leave his country for his country's good. Tom's father, Horatio, was a successful pastoralist who overlanded the family and his stock to Australia Felix, now Western Victoria, in 1836. Horatio was killed in the most famous of all Aboriginal massacres, that at Cullinaringo in 1861, when pioneering a new property in central Queensland, along with Tom, who happily escaped. Indeed, Tom's ancestry was impeccable, but unfortunately, for radical Australian nationalists like me, the sins of the grandfather were not in this case visited upon the grandson, because Horatio, having been freed of the convict stain, determined to make his son a gentleman, and he sent him home for education to rugby. So what Tom Wills knew of football came from what he had learned of the game as it developed under Dr Arnold in the decades following the exploit of William Webb Ellis, who with a fine disregard for the rules of football as played in his time, first took the ball in his arms and ran with it thus originating the distinctive features of the rugby game, AD 1823. But Wills didn't propose the introduction of the rugby game. This was thought to be, in the words of his cousin and brother-in-law, Henry Colden Antill Harrison, unsuitable for grown men making a livelihood. With which one might occur, uh, concur, having read the descriptions of the game in Tom Brown's school days. It's no joke, I can tell you. Why, there's been two collarbones broken this half, and a dozen fellows lamed, and last year a fellow had his leg broken. Australian football began with the Melbourne Football Club in 1858. Over the next few years, new clubs formed, and as with soccer, the needs of inter-club matches demanded a code of rules. The Melbourne Code was adopted. By 1860, the fundamentals of Australian rules had been accepted. The mark, limited running with the ball, no throwing, the beginnings of the holding and dropping the ball law, no tripping, holding or hacking. Then, close, then it was closest to the Harrow game. Now the only similar game is Gaelic football, but the rules as evolved were a distinct Australian creation. From the beginning, it proved attractive to spectators. By the mid-1860s, there were crowds of 1,500 attending. By the mid-1870s, 10,000. By the mid-80s, 20,000. And from the outset, many among them were women. The first admission charges were imposed in the mid-70s, sixpence ahead. Ostensibly, these were to be devoted to the improvement of facilities. But the charges created among club officials and players both temptations of professionalism. 
and this was at the same time as the question of professionalism, came up in soccer in the United Kingdom and in rugby union, where it led to a split in the formation of rugby league. And that was scarcely coincidental. It arose out of the growing leisure, the desire of the urban masses for popular entertainment, the growth of a potential audience, the desire of working class men to have an entree into sport in something like equal terms with gentlemen. And from the 1880s, the game developed in Australia, as in the UK, along two lines. The professional game, which men played at least partly for award, and the amateur game, which men played as gentlemen had always played for recreation. It was the professional game which drew the crowds. But until, until the 1930s, cricket remained preeminent. Those were the heady years of the dramatic conflict between Bradman and McCabe of Australia and Mr Jardine and Larwood of England, the body line series during which notes were exchanged between Australia and the United Kingdom and Australia nearly left the empire. <laughs> the turn came during the war years. Cricket never fully recovered from the break except perhaps for the West Indian tours and football is now many lengths ahead. The grand final crowd at which 120,000 people will fill the MCG next Saturday uh, establishes a continuing record crowd for any sporting event in this country. So the mass demand for entertainment was there in the late 19th century and there was money around to pay for it. But there's no one to gainsay it. The Anglican Church was non-established and in any case it inclined towards muscular Christianity. The nonconformists formed the social base for a peculiar Australian variety of moralism known as Wowserism which objected to sex, drink, gambling, smoking and most other pleasures. But they were caught between the Anglicans and the Catholics, an Irish-based church which inveighed against unlicensed sex but approved of drink and sport so long as they didn't interfere with mass on Sundays. <laughs> so given the climate, which no matter what present-day Melburnians might think about it, seemed to recent arrivals from semi-Arctic England, suitable for outdoor sport all the year round, open-air recreation was an inevitable development. Cricket, racing, hunting, athletics, cycling, aquatics were along with football, early developments, and among them, football finally came to reign supreme. Now, I'd like to move from that brief historical survey to some comments on the game today. Firstly, the players. It is generally assumed that professionalism is a turning point in the attitude of players to their games. Thus, it is assumed that amateurs would play by the code enunciated in what Colonel Alexander M. Babe Vaond, an historian of American gridiron, described as the imperishable words of Grantland Rice. For when the one great scorer comes to mark against your name, he writes not that you won or lost, but how you played the game. Whereas it's generally thought that pros react rather more like Fitzroy's Ian McCulloch, who last year was reported as saying, most players are in it for the money. I know I am, I'm not in Victoria because I like the bloody place. <laughs> That's clearly much too simple. <laughs> we must ask, what is the nature of the pleasure that footballers of any sort get from their game? And is it true that the cash nexus has obliterated pleasure for the professionals? David Reisman shares this last doubt of mine of Gridiron. He says, yet it would be too simple to say that football has ceased to be a game for its players and has become an industry. Consider the statement of that distinguished missing psychologist, Ron Barassi, a leading and most articulate Australian footballer. I think retirement from football is just like death. <laughs> you can't avoid it no matter what you do. And just the same, it's hard to face when it comes. Luckily, I've got the coaching, which I enjoy very much. It's very fulfilling. I'm still in football. The game itself's not really enjoyable. I don't see how a sporting contest with a lot hanging on it can be enjoyable during the actual contest. Afterwards, the enjoyment comes. You're proud. You can remember all the good things you've done. I reckon the Australian footballer is the best all-round athlete in the world. There's no question. Our game's a great game. And several things seem to follow from this. Firstly, Pleasure probably needs to be defined in terms of power, domination, the mastery of one's own physical talents and of the situation within the game, and domination over the spectators. And both these have, of course, a strong element of sexuality, homo as well as hetero. 
Part of it is the desire to win. I don't think it's ever true that players are indifferent to the outcome of the game. And if that is so, then sportsmanship is a code of behaviour designed to regulate competition rather than an ethic of indifference to the result. But Barassi's point about the game not being pleasurable while the fight is on is well taken. But it applies equally to such amateur events as the old Davis Cup and the Olympic Games. A pro may well get the same sort of pleasure out of the game as an amateur. Not the pleasure of a man at play, but the pleasure of a craftsman who takes pride in his skill and his achievement. One side consequence for the players is social mobility. Not only for the sons of new Australian families whose names are written in gold in the annals of Australian football, if not always pronounced terribly accurately by football commentators, Jesselinko, Ditterik, Raskaklik, Pagnokolo, <laughs> but for those whom the white supremacists of our society like to describe as our Aborigines. Thus, when Doug Nichols, uh, Nichols remonstrated with Captain Blood, Jack Dyer, for saying, get out of the bloody way, you black bastard, <laughs> Dyer explained that he was not responsible for anything he said during the game, and certainly he didn't mean it. Nichols was quite welcome to play. <laughs> While at a Richmond Carlton game, I observed the following exchange. A Richmond supporter to Sid Jackson. Leave him alone, you black bludger. A Carlton supporter to the Richmond man. You can't say that to Sid Jackson. Come on, sunshine. <laughs> it also has a spill off into politics. Traditionally, ex-footballers became policemen. Today, they tend to become publicists, publicans, or politicians. Thus, three weeks ago, I was scrutineering for my local friendly councillor in Richmond, and the opponent's scrutineer was sitting beside me, and Kevin Cheedy came in. And I opened the elector's roll, and I ruled off Kevin Cheedy. And my opponent's scrutineer said, who's that? And I said, Kevin Cheedy. And he said, who's Kevin Cheedy? And at that moment, I knew that we had taken Richmond. <laughs> Beyond this, there is the consequence of professionalism in the growing involvement of the game and the players with the mass communications media. The players become pop stars. John Gould designs gear, Don Scott used to model it. Royce Hart and Neil Baum look more and more like Charlie George and Georgie Best, who in turn look more and more like the Beatles and the Stones. And the players themselves become charismatic heroes. Thus, a couple of years ago, outside a church in Hawthorne, the vicar had posted a poster saying, what would you do if God came to Hawthorne today? And a graffitist had written underneath it, move Peter Hudson to centre half forward. <laughs> the colleague who reported that to me said, when I tell the story outside Hawthorne, they say, who's Peter Hudson? But when I tell the story in Hawthorne, they say, who's God? Uh, this is half time, and at half time I usually have the RWF band playing selections from Mary Poppins. <laughs> but unfortunately today they had a prior engagement to play Mac the Knife and Money Won't Buy You Love at the annual general meeting of the Victorian Association of Surgeons. <laughs> so instead I've invited along the incomparable Miss Shirley Jacobs. I'm glad you said that because being International Women's Year and footy being such a butch game, I thought that I might get a few women's messages over today. <laughs> Greetings, girls. <laughs> I've made the concession of in the football song I've put in a women's verse and in the women's verse, I've, in the women's song, I've put in a football verse. <laughs> I'll start with the, with the women's song and it's about... Um, I looked through all the songs that I could find to see the most chauvinistic of all the male songs that have ever been written. And I picked one by Irving Berlin from Annie Get Your Gun called The Girl That I Marry. If you know the words of it, the girl that I marry will have to be, she doesn't have the choice, as soft and as pink as a nursery. <laughs> the girl I call my own will wear satins and laces and smell of cologne, especially when she's putting out the garbage bins. And her nails will be polished, and in her hair she'll wear a gardenia. 
gee, that's cool. <laughs> the only guys I've ever known who, at least the only guys I've ever known by the time they got home from the pub, the gardenia would be black behind your ear. <laughs> anyway, here it is. It's called The Man That I Marry. And um, some of you might be a little bit young for the sort of things I'm singing about. I don't mean you'll be shocked by it, but don't feel that you all have to go out and get what I suggest in this. <laughs> The man that I marry will come to me Complete with his scars of the sick to me The man that I would wed Will not see a girl's duty as a pill before bed And if I am tired as well I might be He won't be demanding his pleasure of me If he's inspired and I'm tired He will jump on his bike For a riot Won't someone please find me This lover I'm longing to meet And I thought that I should say something To the advertising people too For the sort of things Sort of rubbish they put out So the man that I marry If I'm to be had Must look like the man In the Marlboro ad The man that I admire will be sexy and virile with plenty of fire if he smells of brut has no five o'clock shade if that's a real man then I'll die an old maid watching telly with a smelly Pekingese that's as nervous as Nelly won't someone please find me a fair dinkum Marlborough man? And here's the footy verse. And the man that I marry for sure won't be from the football fraternity. The man to whom I'll yield won't be kick, cooking, kicking a football all over a field. If he raves about Rover's back pocket, the ruck, and expects me to listen, well, he's out of luck. <laughs> the only ball games that I treasure are the ones that I play for my leisure with a player who's a stayer and who knows how to be a delayer. Won't someone please find me this rare breed of ball-playing man? <laughs> and the man that I marry won't hand me the line. I like him done, baby. You suit me fine. <laughs> the man that I espouse will not see a girl's duty in solely in-house. I'm sure he won't mind if I use my brain. He won't even mind if I drive a train or conduct it or obstruct it or like wheel and completely destruct it. Won't someone please find me this lover I'm longing to meet? to drag the women's cause into your footy. <laughs> this is called a Melbourne football final and it was written, oh, it was written a while ago actually for a show on Channel 2 and then it's sort of grown. Lots of verses have been added. Now Lou Richards gets the last verse because it's no um, co coincidence that Lou is called Kiss of Death Lou. He, if you do follow the footy, and I don't, but I know Lou, and I know that he picks the wrong teams every week. Some weeks he has clean sweeps. <laughs> out of, <laughs> he gets them all wrong, and he's only got to get one out of two right in one game. And I, I took um, Kev Sheedy out to Pentridge with me recently to do a program, and we were talking about you know, how bad Lou is at picking the sort of winners, and Kev says, geez, he says, I hope Lou doesn't pick my wife. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, here it is, a Melbourne football final. How many fans can you count in the stands at a Melbourne football final? Who are the teams they all go to see at a Melbourne football final? Lions, Tigers, up the Saints, Demons, Blues and Swans are quaint. Listen to the crowd demanding blood. Oh, a boot in the spleen is part of the scene at a Melbourne football final. Who 
but the brave would frown on the game at a Melbourne football final. What sort of traitor would dare cock a snoot at a Melbourne football final? Nuts and homosexuals, long-haired intellectuals, trouble-making students and all that lot. But the fair Dinkum Aussie loves to be seen at a Melbourne football final. Who are the Aussies we all idolise at a Melbourne football final? Sons of Australia, all playing rules at a Melbourne football final. Kekovich and Schimmelbus, Jezelinko, Bridish, Javorski, Grummish, Pack, Knuckle, oh, it's an all Aussie game with an all Aussie name at a Melbourne football final. How many cans rattle down the stands at a Melbourne football final? If your team should lose, you console yourself in booze at a Melbourne football final. Watch them with refinement sip lager at the premiership. No need for glasses, there isn't time. And it's luncheon, of course, on a meat pie and sauce at a Melbourne football final. How many women were there at the fray of a Melbourne football final? What were the words he uttered on that day of a Melbourne football final? Don't get out of bed till six, I will take you to the flicks. Don't worry now, cause I've got to go. And the flickers that they saw, saw were the replays of the day at a Melbourne football final. Last year it was North Melbourne versus Richmond, and of course Lou tipped North, so they were 10 goals down when they walked onto the field. <laughs> Tigers versus Roos, that was it that day at a Melbourne football final. Claws versus Paws, poised for the fray at a Melbourne football final. Calm the Tigers, calm the Roos, cries unheard outside of zoos, drowning all else at the MCG, and a jaunty kiss of death from a Judas christened Lou at a Melbourne football final. It's Shirley Jacob. And now the <coughs> ideology of the game, apart from the attitudes of the players and the fans. There are all the usual rationalisations, men sana in corpore sano, which happens to be the motto of the Carlton Football Club. Muscular Christianity, but that's no longer terribly fashionable. The playing fields of Eton in 1908, affable Alf Deacon forecast that when Australians were called on to defend their country in the field of battle, the battles would have already been won on the Australian rules playing fields while 30 years later, Honest Joe Lyons said that the Battle of Gallipoli had indeed been won on those same playing fields. Note that Australians habitually count Gallipoli as a victory. <laughs> as with American football and baseball, of which uh, Cousins and Stumpf in 1953 wrote, the bleachers are equally cordial to coal miners, politicians and bank presidents, and as with soccer, of which Dr Young spoke of its basically democratic character, the adherents of Australian football proclaim it to be a democratic game. The motto of the VFL is Populo Ludus Populi, the game of the people for the people. I don't believe this, the game is no more democratic than society. It's true that it's largely open to the talents, but it's not true that Snowy on the trams is as good as the president of BHP. The latter has a considerably better chance of making the club committee than Snowy, and he can usually buy himself a better seat to watch the finals. What the statement probably means is that, these, is that these mass spectator sports have a broad cross-class appeal, and that is true. As a New Zealand friend once commented to me, Australia was the only country he had visited in the world where the conversation in the gents' pissoir at the university staff club was the same as that at the local pub, football and races. <laughs> but class differences still find their expression in the fence between the utter and the stand and in the extra edge on such matches as those between high-toned Melbourne and a democratic Collingwood, as they were described as long ago as the 1870s. The Barrackers. Almost the only thing known about Australian football fans is how many of them pay to go in. <laughs> and since they do pay to go, and it's not yet compulsory, 
it's reasonable to they it's reasonable to assume that they go because they get pleasure out of it. But the source of that pleasure, no one knows. When Ron Barassi was asked what spectators got out of football, he answered, you'd have to be a psychiatrist to answer that. The usual psychological explanation has an historical base in the view once widely held by anthropologists that games are a kind of imitative warfare. Thus, Dr Gilbert Slater, in an article called Concerning Golf and Other Balls, in the Sociological Review in 1911, thought of those participating in ball games as responding to the very stimulus which maddened uncounted generations of your ancestors through ages of Paleolithic savagery in tribal warfare. The spectators, of course, share in this by identifying with the players. The argument is familiar. It was clearly stated by the psychoanalyst A.A. Brill in the North American Review in 1929. All men have an aggressive component in their psyche. This is one of the primary weapons in the fight for survival. However, this aggressiveness is potentially socially destructive. Therefore, it needs to be socially manageable and it needs socially approved outlets. And one such outlet is spectator sport. The same point, of course, is made about other kinds of mass entertainment like the films of Sam Peckinpah and Ken Russell. Brill says sports are a great and necessary catharsis, indispensable to civilised man. A salutary purgation of the combative instincts which have dammed up within him would break out in disastrous ways. To this might be added a couple of sophistications, one psychological, but perhaps it's not merely a matter of securing a release for an existing tension, but also of a human need to create tension in order to, to achieve the pleasure of release on the analogy of copulation. And one sociological, suggested by Elias and Dunning, in a paper at the British Sociological Association Conference in 1967, that in a culture which disapproves of the public expression of emotion and which offers progressively fewer occasions for excitement, the need for this release is increasingly concentrated in leisure activities. And indeed, that view has been confirmed by my own field work in this area. Catharsis is achieved not only by players, but by spectators. Thus, at a moment during the final quarter, quarter of a St Kilda and Richmond match at Moorabbin, when the Tigers, having been down five goals, were now drawing ahead, a St Kilda supporter, 30-ish, short back and sides, running to fat, white shirt, clasping a can of Carlton Draft, addressed himself to the umpire. <laughs> you rotten, bloody, commo, poofter, mongrel bastard. <laughs> he had given vent to all the Australian political, social, racial, sexual and male chauvinist prejudices. <laughs> He had projected them onto the representative of bourgeois imperialist fascist repression. <laughs> and one hopes he had achieved a satisfactory purgation and didn't beat his wife that night. <laughs> now, the meaning of the game. It's been a long time lament of Australian socialists that if only the Australian workers transferred the thought they invest in picking winners and the passion they invest in football into politics, we would have had the revolution long ago. The catharsis view of fan psychology perhaps lends weight to this belief and there's some reason to think that Cousins and Stump are right when they say that sport is an integrating factor in American democracy. That is, that it cuts across class barriers and thus tends to damp down class hostility. And some support for this view comes from a Victorian football official, a Mr McBrien, who in the American Rotarian in 1940 wrote, as an emotional safety valve, football has tonic properties. Young people must have some outlet for their nervous energy. In other parts of the world, the outlet is politics. In Australia, it is football. I think we can probably dismiss such attributed meanings as men's sana, training for leadership, learning how to play the game according to the rules, that is, the game of life in the guise of football, and the voice of, voice of the schoolboy rallying the, the, rallying the ranks as moralistic rationalisations. Though I wouldn't like to omit from this discussion Dr Gilbert Slater's discussion of why other things being equal, the boy brought up on rugby will make a better man and a better citizen than the boy brought up on soccer. Quote, Consider the manner in which in individual com combatants meet one another in the two games. In soccer, the defence meets the attacker by the shoulder charge. In rugby, the defender clasps his arms lovingly around the attacker. <laughs> if he knows how to collar properly, he puts his whole energy into that embrace and sinks gently to the ground with his opponent. <laughs> the difference in psychic reaction is considerable. I am convinced that the schoolboy feels just one degree more friendly to a schoolfellow when he has collared him, just one degree less friendly when he has charged him. 
In modern anthropological terms, this is a structural and functional explanation of the game. But it needs to round it out the, the dimension added by the badminton book of football in 1888, speaking of a traditional game between bachelors and married men. The object of the married men was to hang the ball. That is, to put it three times into a small hole in the moor. That of the bachelors was to drown it, or dip it three times in a deep place in the river. The party who could affect either of these objects won the game and the ball. If neither won, the ball was cut in equal parts at sunset. If I read my symbolism aright, that's a very threatening concept. <laughs> I owe to Adrian Stokes in an article called The Psychoanalytic Psycho Reflections on the Development of Ball Games in 1956, the observation that for fieldsmen, a fieldsman to catch a batsman out in cricket is an act of symbolic castration. <laughs> I am saddened to think that similar punishments should be inflicted on the losers in football. I am attracted by these psychological explanations. <laughs> Some have seen the ball itself as a symbol of perfection. Thus Cicero in his On the Nature of the Gods. What can be more beautiful than the figure that encircles and encloses in itself all other figures, and that can possess no roughness or point of collision on its surface, no indentation or concavity, no protuberance or depression? While in the 6th century AD, philosophers were arguing that the resurrected body must be spherical, which opens a very interesting area of speculation as to just who it is that Lee Matthews will be kicking through the goals next Saturday. <laughs> Again, the Dutch philosopher Budenteich, in a book called Football, a Philosophical Study in 1954, says of the ball that it is the most simple and perfect of all forms, the qualities of which one can enter into by touching and fondling. But the sphere has an archetypal magical significance as sun and moon, it is both ritual symbol and object of worship. There is perhaps some support for this in the action of the Brazilian football fan who, in despair that his team was doing so badly, took out his revolver and shot the ball. <laughs> but when one considers that the ball in a game of football spends much more of its time being kicked, punched, thrown and headed than being fondled, it seems that the explanation can hardly stand. Perhaps R.W. Pickford comes closer to the truth in an article in the British Journal of Psychology in 1940 when he discusses the difference between rugby and soccer. He says that in rugby, the ball is lovingly caught and caressed, that the image is maternal, whereas in soccer, the ball is kicked away, treated as a dangerous or unclean object, a symbol of paternal potency. My objection to this as a follower of Australian football should perhaps be dismissed as emotional, but it is that in Australian football, the ball is both caught and fondled and kicked and punched, and therefore Pickford's theory leaves me quite uncertain about my own sexual identity. <laughs> However, personally, it is the Freudian interpretation of the great Australian game which most strongly attracts me. We are dealing here with one of the four greatest minds of our era, and it is inconceivable that such an intelligence should not have been brought to bear on such a centrally significant contemporary cultural phenomenon as the great Australian game and indeed such was the case. One of the elementary propositions of Freudian psychology is that nothing happens by chance. Thus, in the psychopathology of everyday life, uh, which deals with the specific, uh, which has specific application to language and its uses, Freud discusses the names that we give everyday objects. Consider the vocabulary of Australian football. Words, phrases, injunctions like ruck, punt, forward flank, ball up, Put it between the big sticks. <laughs> Those are indicative of, though not central to the point I want to make. <laughs> the next significant revelation comes from Freud's theory of the personality developed in his introductory lectures to psychoanalysis. Freud suggests a tri triple-tiered personality in appearance not unlike the outer stand at the MCG. <laughs> there is a deeply submerged id situated at ground level in which reside the instinctual drives towards aggression and sexuality. There is a superego soaring high, abo uh, high above like a psychic scoreboard on which we record the successes and failures of our oppressions or sex drives, depending on the criteria from which we start. And there is the ego, that part of the persona which we care or which we are allowed by the superego to expose to the football gaze. And if we think of the personality of Australian football, of course it fits the Freudian model. Because there, Beyond the palings which represent the boundary between the conscious and the unconscious mind stands the hundred thousand headed id, straining at the leash of its repressions, howling to its ego for violent and erotic release. 
And there, strategically distributed over the green sward, which represents the conscious mind, stand the five chaste white-clad figures of the superego, <laughs> their whistles and flags poised to warn at any moment, down, id, down. <laughs> and there, also within the realm of the conscious mind, stand the 36 multicoloured particles of the ego, representing all that the superego wishes the id to aspire to, revealing those characteristics with the, which the Australian football personality is proud to profess. Stoic endurance, heroic endeavour, a beauty akin to that of the Greek warriors, in which the instinctual drives of aggression and sexuality are sublimated in the elaborate mime of the great Australian game. But there are more insights to come. In his interpretation of dreams, Freud demonstrates that even the most innocent of objects conceal an elaborate erotic symbolism. And indeed, since everything appears visually as either a straight line or a curve, it's difficult to see how it could be otherwise. <laughs> what then is the symbolism of Australian football? I suggest that from the moment when Barry Davis, the heroic figures of Barry Davis and Lee Matthews, burst through the thin membrane stretched by the Vestal Virgins across the entrance to the Oval, <laughs> to the accompaniment of the ritual waving of multicoloured, be ribboned phallic objects in an act of symbolic defloration, <laughs> and the release of inflated spheres which bear mute witness to the potency of the celebrants, from then to that climactic moment when the acolytes carry the victorious high priest still triumphantly erect out of the oval and down the dark passage to the undressing rooms. <laughs> I suggest that the whole game is one long playing out of the sex act. For those who have got the football message, its purpose and function are clear. Australian football is nothing other than an elaborate and arcane fertility rite. <laughs> a female-oriented liberationist interpretation might take a more complex form. Thus the ground, which is invaded by large numbers of men, is taken to be the symbolic body of the woman, which highlights an interesting difference between American and Australian national characters. In American gridiron, men are required to capture one erogenous zone after another until they score a try, <laughs> which might be taken as a thinly disguised way of trying to score. Whereas in Australian football, the men, in an undisciplined and anti-authoritarian manner, roam virtually at will across the field, acting out the Australian national fantasy of Sydney or the bush. <laughs> but there are those who focus on the ball rather than on the ground, and who see the ball as a symbolic womb. And those who contend for this symbolic womb, what are their roles? They clutch the womb symbol to them, they double over it, they roll on it, they seek to transfer it to their fellow celebrants by striking it with legs or arms, which are themselves but thinly disguised phallic objects, for the Freudian scholar, there is only one mystery in the symbolism of Australian football. Why is it that the victory goes to those who succeed most often in placing the womb symbol between the central two of four upright poles? I was mystified by this myself. <laughs> and this is my principal original contribution to research in this area. My research has uncovered the fact that originally there were not four poles, but two. And once I had uncovered the truth of the early and essential reality of the great Australian game, it became clear that the poles were in fact structural or dialectical polarities, and that the real object of this weekly ritual, which has now been deeply repressed, or perhaps overlaid by later cultural accretions, was not to place the womb symbol between the two poles, but rather to impale it on one or other pole. <laughs> and once we have grasped the true structural reality of the two poles and not four, the hidden meaning of the ritual at last becomes evident. The ball represents the wife and mother, Yocasta, and the real purpose of the celebrants is to determine the outcome of that oldest of all sexual battles, whether the ball should be impaled on the post representing Laius, the father, or on that of Oedipus, the son. Finally, a word on the totemic significance of Australian football. In his Totem and Debut, Freud says, among the Australians, the system of totemism takes the place of all religious and social institutions, an aphorism which he has clearly derived from his observations of the great Australian game. Freud's message, which was based on the field work of some distinguished Australian anthropologists, including Lou Richards, <laughs> who once commented, I was born into a magpie family and reared in the magpie nest. <laughs> Freud's message is all too clear. It is of fundamental importance. Indeed, it is a totemic sin for him to do otherwise for the tiger man to mate not with the tiger woman, but with a woman of the rue or any other totem. For otherwise, 
how can one's own totem increase? It is clear, however, that there are some special problems associated with swans. Those who take the swan totem and consciously identify themselves with Zeus, who in the guise of this noble bird conducted an exhilarating affair with the delectable leader. But I hope that those who are present of the swan totem will not forget the solemn warning of the porter of St John's College, Oxford, that them swans is reserved for the dons. <laughs> Finally, Freud draws attention to the prohibition against the adherence of a totem eating their ancestral father, except on those ritual occasions on which the totemites, regaling themselves in symbolic representations of the fur or feathers of their totem, ceremonially consume a portion of the totemic creature, thereby taking unto themselves its potency and strength. And this is the final proof of the validity of the Freudian hypotheses in their application to the ritual life of Australian football adherence. For does not this sacred totemic practice survive in attenuated but clearly apparent form in that greatest of all Australian tribal chants, which next year will be transmitted by satellite from the remote wildernesses of Boston and Earls Court? Can the tigers eat them alive? <laughs>